Good morning from the Episcopal Church in Navajo Land. I am here today with Reverend Michael Sells, and I am canon to the ordinary Cornelia Eaton. And we are grateful to be with you here from the Pajon Center, the Beauty Way Chapel in Farmington, New Mexico. Thank you for being with us and to worship with us and to give thanks to God for everything that God does for us and in our lives as we continue to carry out <clears throat> our work and our ministry and our service to those in need and to those around us. And we give thanks for your presence and for your prayers with us always. So, Kihat, Kwande, Kihat, Shish, we will begin our morning prayer on page 78, and we're going to begin with uh, the gathering prayer. Let us pray. Creator, we give you thanks for all you are and all you bring to us for our visit within your creation. In Jesus, you place the gospel in the center of this sacred circle through which all of creation is related. You show us the way to live a generous and compassionate life. Give us your strength to live together with respect and commitment as we grow in your spirit. For you are God, now and forever. Amen. Send out your light and your truth, that they may lead me and bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Lord, open our lips. And our mouths to proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father, Father and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, Spirit as it Lord, was in the beginning, Lord, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Hallelujah. Worship the Lord in beauty of holiness. Come, let us adore him. <clears throat> On page 82, let us read the Jubilate together. Be joyful in the Lord, all you lands. Serve, Serve the, the Lord, Lord with gladness, and, and come before his presence with a song. Know this, this, the Lord himself is God. He himself, himself has, has made us, us and we, we are his. We are Lord his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his, his gates with thanksgiving and go into his courts with praise. Give thanks, thanks to him, him and call him. upon his name. For the, the Lord, Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his faithfulness endures from age to age. The psalm for this morning is Psalm 145, Psalm 145, 1 through 8. Psalm 145, 1 through 8, found on page 801 in the prayer book. Let us say it all together. I will exalt, O God, my King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day will I bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and great to be praised. 
there is no end to his greatness. One generation shall raise your works to another and shall declare your power. I will ponder the glorious splendor of your mercy and all your mercy works. They shall speak of the light of your wondrous acts, and I will tell of your greatness. They shall publish the remembrance of your great goodness. They shall sing of your righteous deeds. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger, and of great goodness. Glory, Glory to, to the Father, Father, and to the Son, and, and to the Holy Spirit, as, as it was, was in the beginning, is now, and will, will be forever. Amen. Please be seated for a question. Okay. You, you got the question? Yes. And, uh, I'm reading from Philippians 1, <clears throat> 20. 1 through 28. Oh my gosh. New contacts. Can I use your... Sorry. Philippians 1, 21 through 30. To me, living in Christ is dying again. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which I prefer. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. Yet I am convinced of this. I know that I will reign and continue with all of you for your progress and joy and faith, so that I may share abundantly in your boasting in Christ Jesus when I come to you again. Only live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I am absent and hear about you, I will know that you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind from the faith of the gospel, and are in no way intimidated by your opponents. For them, this is evidence of, your, of their destruction, but of your salvation. And this is God's doing, for he has graciously granted you the privilege not only of believing in Christ, but of suffering of him as well. Since you are having the same struggle that, saw, that I saw I had, and now here I still have. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. On page 92, let us read Canticle 16. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty Savior, born of the house of his servant David. Though his holy prophets he promised of old that he would save us from our enemies, from the hands of who pay us. He promised to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath he swore to our father Abraham to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight, all the days of our life. You, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation, for the forgiveness of their sins, and the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us, to shine on those who dwell in darkness in the shadow of death, and to guide our feet in the way of peace. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Glory Lord. To you Lord Christ. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, Why are you standing idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last, then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner saying, these work these last worked only one hour and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat but he replied to one of them friend i am doing you no wrong did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage take what belongs to you and go I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do this, what I choose, with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord, Lord Christ. Christ. At this time and place of, of our reflection, um, we are offering a uh, sermon uh, that was previously recorded by the Episcopal Church of our presiding bishop, uh, Michael Curry, who will offer a message of what it means to be a beloved community uh, during this time, and especially during these times that can be very uh, <clears throat> difficult, challenging, and but here are words of hope that um, will continue to help us and to guide us into the way of beauty way. Thank you. Now in the name of our loving, liberating, and life-giving God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. This November, the people of the United States will elect a president and many others to public office. This election occurs in a time of global pandemic, time when there is hardship, sickness, suffering, and death. This election also occurs in a time of great divisions, divisions that are deep, dangerous, and potentially injurious to democracy. So what is the role of the church, the context of an election being held in a time such as this? 
what is our role as individual followers of Jesus Christ committed to his way of love in such a time as this. Allow me to offer a text from the Acts of the Apostles, the introduction to the Acts from the first chapter. Luke writes, in the first book, referring to the Gospel of Luke, in the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up into heaven. In the first book, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught. All that he did, all that he taught. In a powerful sermon preached at the July meeting of the House of Bishops, Bishop Scott Hayashi of Utah said something that might be helpful to us. He made mention of, you know, the little acronym, what would Jesus, WWJD, what would Jesus do? And he said that that can be a helpful way of discerning what we might be being called to do at any given time. But he offered another alternative. He said, what would happen if we began to ask the question, not what would Jesus do, but what did Jesus do? What did he do? What did he teach? What do Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John tell us that Jesus did and taught? I want to suggest that addressing that question, what did Jesus do? and summoning the spirit to help us apply it to our lives and to our times may mean the difference between the church simply being another religious institution that exists for its own sake and the church being a Jesus movement that courageously follows the way of Jesus and his love, not for its sake, but for the sake of the world that Christ gave his life for and rose from the dead in. As you know, the Episcopal Church does not endorse, support, or oppose political candidates for elective office. And there is good reason for that. First, in the United States, tax-exempt religious and charitable organizations are by law prohibited from such endorsement, support, or opposition to candidates. This does not prohibit churches from engaging in voter education, voter registration, helping people get to the polls to vote, or even advocating for issues of public policy reflective of the tenets of our faith. And every citizen, of course, including those of us who are members of the church, have our rights and responsibilities as well. Secondly, there are good and faithful followers of Jesus Christ who are Episcopalian. Some are Republican. Some are Democrat. Some are independents. Some liberal. Some centrist. Some conservative. Just as we must respect the right of every citizen to cast his or her own vote according to the dictates of their conscience, so we must do so in the church, the body of Jesus Christ. And that is how it should be. The Bible says we have one Lord, one faith, one baptism, not one political party. But it's important to remember that partisan neutrality does not mean moral neutrality. Partisan neutrality bidden to us by human civil law does not mean moral neutrality bidden to us by the royal law of Almighty God. And this may be where our text helps us. Go back to the text. In the first book, O Theophilus, I wrote all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until he was taken up into heaven. When Luke says the first book, he's referring to the gospel. Notice what he does so skillfully. 
ancient tradition says that that Luke was a physician. And we know that this Luke was the author of both the gospel and the Acts of the Apostles. And tradition says he was a physician. And you can see elements of that throughout both books. But in this text, Luke the physician sounds more like Luke the lawyer. In this text, Luke is, is suggesting that the Jesus we see in, in the gospel, what he did and what he taught, is precedent. It is the precedent for how those who would follow him will act and live in their days and in their times. Just as precedents are critical to the law, the precedent of Jesus is critical to the life of those who would follow him in the first century or in the 21st century. When Jesus says that the entire law and will of God is summed up in the words, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, that's precedent. When Jesus told the parable of the Good Samaritan about somebody as that old song says, if I can help somebody along the way, then my living will not be in vain. When he tells the parable of the Good Samaritan, of somebody who helps somebody else, even though they were a different religious tradition, even though they were of a different ethnic group, even though they may have differed in their politics, differed in their worldview, differed in virtually everything except the fact that they inhale oxygen and exhale carbon dioxide. Even with all of those differences, he helped him because that person, that man, was a human child of God, created in the image of God. Jesus says, now, who was neighbor to the man? This is what loving your neighbor looks like. And then Jesus says, go and do likewise. That's precedent. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, blessed are the poor and the poor in spirit. Jesus says, blessed are those who are compassionate and merciful. When Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers. When he says, blessed are, are, are those who hunger and, and thirst and labor for God's righteous justice to be done on the earth for all. When Jesus says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. When he, when he says, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who despitefully use you. My sisters, my brothers, my siblings, that is the precedent for what it means to follow in the way of Jesus in the first century or the 21st century. St. Paul heard and knew these teachings of Jesus, and he summarized their meaning. Do not be overcome by evil. Overcome evil with good. Henry David Thoreau, Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King, all spoke of this as the nonviolent way of love task of the church in the first century or 21st century is to live by the precedent, to bear witness to the precedent, lift up the values of the precedent of Jesus in our time. Because as the book of Hebrews says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What would Jesus do? So what can we do? Well, we can vote as individuals. We can vote. And we can help others to register and to get to the polls and cast their vote. We can encourage others to vote as their conscience leads them. I know someone is probably thinking that's true. What does that have to do with Jesus Christ? What does voting have to do with the gospel? What does voting have to do with being a Christian? An election for public office is not a popularity contest between two or more people. It's a contest of ideas about how to shape the future of a community, nation, maybe even a world. It's a contest, a debate, a discernment of moral values and their relationship 
to public policy. Voting is an act of moral agency. It is an act of moral discernment and decision. It is how a community or a nation decides how the moral values that it holds and shares shape public policy and the lives of people, the children of God. It is salutary to remember partisan neutrality does not mean moral neutrality. The vote is so sacred and important for all people, regardless of your religious tradition or your politics or your nationality, the vote as an act of moral humanity is so important. The people have given their lives for it. If you don't believe Michael Curry, ask the people of Belarus right now. Ask the American martyrs who sacrificed, gave their lives, gave that last full measure of devotion so that people might have the right to vote. Ask Michael Schroener, ask James Cheney, ask Andrew Goodman in Mississippi. Ask the martyrs of Selma, Viola LaRusso, Jimmy Lee Jackson, Jonathan Daniels. America's soldiers have fought to defend freedom. Many of them have given their lives. Many of them live with wounds, the scars of war. One of the freedoms they defended was the freedom, right and the responsibility John Lewis, in his last published writing before his death, said, and I quote, the vote is the most powerful nonviolent change agent that you have in a democratic society, end quote. Believe it or not, there actually is in the New Testament an example of this model of living for followers of Jesus. You'll find it in the writings of St. Paul, the 12th, 13th, and 14th chapters. Now, I don't mean to suggest that Paul voted. He didn't, he was a Roman citizen, but he lived not in the time of the Roman Republic, but in the time of the Roman Empire. But Paul, in Romans 13, specifically identified the teachings of Jesus with how he would live his life in both civil society and in Christian community. In the 13th chapter of Romans, he speaks about the role of government. And then he quickly shifts from speaking about the role of government to the role of the citizen, and then the role of the Christian who is a disciple in the empire. He says, you. You have to pay taxes to whom taxes to do and honor to whom honor is due. And then he says, but owe no one anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment, they are summed up in this word, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Partisan neutrality is not the same as moral neutrality. It was not in the first century, and it is not today. The royal law of love is the fulfillment of the law and the will of God. It is the ultimate standard, norm, and guide or following the way of Jesus in any society, in any time. With grace to aid, and conscience to guide, each of us must discern and decide what love of neighbor looks like in our lives 
in our actions, in our personal relationships, and in our social and public witness. What did Jesus do? The vote is vitally important, but it's not enough. The wounds and the divisions in American society are so deep that even an election by itself cannot heal them. The murder of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and so many others has exposed the death-dealing depth of racism and white supremacy deeply embedded in the soil and in the soul of America. We can't go on like this. Just this past weekend, two deputy sheriffs in Compton, California, were deliberately shot as they sat on duty in their car. And then a group of people tried to block the entrance to the hospital where they were being taken, shouting, let them die. Those two sheriffs are children of God. George Floyd and Breonna Taylor are children of God. We cannot go on this way. In 1858, as divisions in this nation over slavery, born of racism, would lead to a civil war. Abraham Lincoln gave a speech warning the nation, quoting the words of the Lord Jesus Christ who said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. I am not suggesting that we are on the verge of a civil war but we must not underestimate the danger of the divisions that we are in. These divisions are dangerous, injurious to democracy itself. We must, and I believe we can, find a better way. I am a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ because I believe he has shown us that better way. I believe that, that the way of unselfish, sacrificial love can show us the way of repentance, the way to repair the breach, the way of reconciliation that ultimately can lead us to the beloved community. But it's not easy. And this is long distance work. There are no quick fixes because the wounds are so deep. But we need not feel enslaved by fate. We are not people of fate. We are people of faith. The God who raised Jesus from the dead. Nothing can defeat God or stop God's cause of love. The way will not be easy. We can do this. I've included some links to resources that may be helpful to you. One is an online curriculum titled, Make Me an Instrument of Peace, a Guide to Civil Discourse, prepared by our Office of Government Relations. Another is titled, Learn, Pray, Act, Resources for Responding to Racial Violence, curated by our staff for Racial Reconciliation and Justice and the Office of Government Relations. Another contains resources from the Center for Racial Healing in the Diocese of Atlanta. And another contains resources titled, With Malice Toward None, an ecumenical nonpartisan program designed for churches and faith communities and groups of all kinds to provide a way of understanding and healing for those on any side of the political spectrum 
both before and after the November elections. On March 10th, 2016, then president elect or presidential candidate, Donald Trump spoke at a campaign rally in Fayetteville, North Carolina. The rally was, the rally was disrupted by protesters, something that happened around the country to both Trump and Clinton campaigns. Eventually, law enforcement officials led the protesters out. As they did, a 79-year-old Trump supporter named John McGraw, who was white, jumped out from the crowd and punched Rakeem Jones, one of the protesters who was black, punched him in the face. Afterward, McGraw said in that quote, he deserved it. The next time we see him, we might have to kill him. We don't know who he is. He might be with a terrorist organization, end quote. McGraw was arrested and charged with assault. Months later, the two men met again, this time in court. McGraw pleaded no contest, apologized, and was sentenced to 12 months probation. Afterward, the two men actually faced each other and shook hands. McGraw said, and I quote, if I met you in the street, and the same thing occurred, I would have said, go home. One of us will get hurt. That, that's, what I, that's what I would have said. We are caught up in a political mess today, you and me. We've got to heal our country. Sometime after that, at the request of Rakeem Jones, John McGraw, and Rakeem Jones went out and ate lunch together. There is the sign of hope. They went to lunch together. It's an old spiritual created and sung by slaves in the antebellum America that said, I'm gonna come to the welcoming table one of these days, I'm going to eat at the welcoming table. One of these days, I'm going to drink milk and honey at the welcoming table. One of these days, I'm going to cross the River Jordan. One of these days, I'm going to eat. We're going to eat at the welcoming table. One of these days, we can, we will, we must learn to eat at that welcoming table. Jesus has shown us the way. It is the way of unselfish, sacrificial love. That way can make room for us all. So walk together, children. Don't you get weary. Because there's a great camp meeting in the promised land. Amen. Let us continue with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again in accordance on the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, 
the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. In the language of our choice, let us pray the Lord's Prayer. Ado <laughs> Ado ni hido no tachin, ado ni eshe. And the Bahagit e, this is Ado Yastan Hini. Hala alako, be old niko, be hazani, do be edzidi, in the be yo e te, hol ago, ene. Amen. On page 97, let us pray the suffrage, suffrage a. Show us your mercy, O Lord. And grant us your salvation. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Let your people sing with joy. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world. For only in you can we live in safety. Lord, keep this nation under your care. And guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let your way be known upon the earth. Your saving help among all nations. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten. Nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God. And sustain us with your Holy Spirit. The colic of the day is found on page 234, and it's uh, colic uh, 20. Proper 20. Let us pray. Grant us, Lord, not to be anxious about earthly things, but to love things heavenly. And even now, while we are placed among things that are passing away, to hold fast to those that shall endure. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. On page uh, 98, the call it for Sunday. Oh God, you make us glad with the weekly remembrance of the glorious resurrection of your Son, our Lord. Give us this day such blessing through our worship of you, that the week to come may be spent in your favor through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. A call it for peace. O God, the author of peace and lover of concord, to know you is eternal life, and to serve you is perfect freedom. Defend us, your humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in your defense, may not fear the power of any adversaries. Through the might of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified, receive our supplications and prayers we offer before you for all members of your holy church, that in their vocation and ministry they may surely and devoutly serve you through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. On page 387, we will find the uh, prayers of the people on 387, form three, and uh, Reverend Michael will, will lead us in this prayer. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. That we all may be one. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you. That your name may be glorified by all people. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. That they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. 
that there may be just there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. That our works may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer any grief or trouble. That they may be delivered from their distress. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. At this time, I ask your prayers to remember all those who are sick and for those who are lonely and for those who are struggling with any form of addictions. Be with our congregations, especially in Navajo land. Pray for St. Luke's, All Saints, St. Michael's, St. Mark's, Good Shepherd, St. Joseph's, St. Mary's of the Moonlight, St. Christopher's, St. John the Baptizer. Remember clergy and laity who do the work of God, who continue to carry out your love and your message and your gift of hope and blessings. We pray for this world that is hurting deeply. We pray, Jesus, that you may Heal every heart and every soul. Remember our elders and our elderly, our Masane do Unkeche, Bedachni, Koe Yahayad Eho, Benatan Tin Dahma, Eba Hekanitsen, Do Yo Ajoba Date. Da bitzi got edo ado ho mkeshon mkeshon da hana shango ba hek nitsin shamashan da che anasho mka afchen to patso da dinsin mka waya jado asho kashi bitchen da hek nande jesus ay ha ayo de yo yo nyo got e koya ha e Yat eho bena antini, e naso na de ne kafto bit ho, shitine ho eha ba hekusi. Adon ki jade eha da betzi, tun kitso de zendahalo, atro de e ba hekan de zendi, konde de yen yot e, e hekhe dandi nidone. Amen. <clears throat> um, let's see here on page 836 uh, we're going to close with the general thanksgiving let us pray accept O Lord our thanks and praise for all that you have done for us we thank you for the splendor of the whole creation for the beauty of this world, for the wonder of life, and for the mystery of love. We thank you for the blessing of family and friends, and for the loving care that surrounds us on every side. We thank you for setting us at tasks which demand our best efforts, and for leading us to accomplishments which satisfy and delight us. We thank you also for those disappointments and failures that lead us to acknowledge our dependence on you alone. Above all, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, for the truth of his word and the example of his life, for his steadfast obedience by which he overcame temptation, 
for his dying through which he overcame death, and for his rising to life again in which we are raised to the life of your kingdom. Grant us the gift of your spirit that we may know Christ and make him known, and through him at all times and in all places, may give thanks to you in all things. Amen. Let us pray the Navajo Blessing Way Prayer. Jesus Christ of Kenagani, Digin a Yote, Digin a Lini, Adni Yen Ishla, Digin a Yasani, Digin a Tuisani, On the Shnigi and Shedo, Nebehez Ani, Big Egona Shado, On the Shnigi and Edo, Shik Eden Edo, Shit Ansen Zido, Such Aunt of Dilnito. Shit <laughs> Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. This concludes our morning prayer. Thank you for being with us. I can't do a yad eho, jonagon na de yon katoge. Yeah. Okone.